So <clears throat> quality, quality control. So this presentation will be about mainly quality, quality control of raw sequencing reads. And after that, because you will use it uh, during the exercises, we will also shortly talk about databases where you can store read data. So why would you actually perform quality control? Uh, one major reason is that if you generate sequence read is that you want to know the base quality. The base quality is a proxy for accuracy. So how well the base color actually knew that the base it called, so the A, the T, the C, or G, was actually that base. Um, so it tells you something about the error rate, obviously. Uh, second one would be what is the read length? For Illumina sequencing, usually you should know that beforehand because that's a setting of the machine. Uh, but for example, for long read sequencing, uh, you do not really know that beforehand. Depends on the library prep and how well the sequencing run went. So then that's a very important quality measure, especially if you're interested in long reads, you hope to get long reads, obviously. Um, another one could be, are there adapters in my sequences? Barcodes do not occur very frequently, but adapters, they do. Um, sometimes that happens and you want to figure out whether that's the case and remove them if you can. Uh, are there overrepresented sequences? So sequences that occur more frequently than you would expect if you do whole genome sequences, sequencing, uh, you usually do not expect a lot of overrepresented sequences. But if you do, for example, RNA seq because you have a difference in gene expression, you expect that some sequences occur more frequently than others just because you have a difference in gene expression. So those are four relatively important things you usually check when you look at um, Illumina data, but also on uh, long read data. And how would you get that information? Well, luckily there's a lot of software uh, written that can help you do that. Uh, one would be the manufacturer software. So all of the sequencing uh, technologies, uh, they provide uh, some level of quality control with uh, their machine. Uh, that's the case for Illumina, PacBio, and for Oxford Nanopore technology, um, especially for the long read sequencing uh, methods. It is recommended to have a look at those because their quality measures can be quite specific. Um, for Illumina, by far the most frequently used quality control software would be FastQC. That's also the software we will be playing around with during the exercises. Uh, for in addition to the manufacturer software for Oxford Nanopore technology, uh, Pico QC might be interesting. There's really a lot of nice visualization uh, with Pico QC, for example, about the number of active pores and the pore activity. Uh, Nanoplot is a nice general quality control uh, software for both Oxford Nanopore technology and BackBio. It's relatively lightweight and, and easy to use. So it's for, for first glance at your data, um, that's, that's very nice software. And uh, while um, uh, methods evolve, also software uh, evolve. So there are quite a lot of different tools on the market, but this just to mention those, uh, I think, most frequently used ones. So usually what you get um, when, for example, when you have done sequencing, often that is done by a sequencing uh, facility uh, at your university or, or at your department, for example, what you usually got, it, get is a FOT Q file. Um, for PacBio, it can also be a BOM file, but the same, the same information, roughly the same information is stored in a BOM file as in a FASTQ file. So what is a FASTQ file? It is nothing more than a uh, FASTA file. The FASTA file contains, um, the, uh, se contains sequences. So the actual code bases would, you could store in a FASTA file, but you also, together with those sequences, you want to store the base quality, so the accuracy of the, of the base calling. So therefore it is called FASTQ. And this base quality is a uh, minus 10 
times the log 10 of the probability that a base is wrong. So if you have a low probability that the base is wrong, you have high accuracy, and therefore you have a high base quality. So if you have a base quality, oops, sorry. If you have a base quality of 20, you have a probability that the base is wrong of 0.01, so an accuracy of 99%. If you have a base quality of three, then your uh, probability that the base is wrong is very high, and therefore you have a high error rate and therefore a very low accuracy. So in the graph below, you see how error and accuracy are related to the FRET score. So that is this base quality score, it's called the FRET score. Uh, so if uh, the FRET score increases, the accuracy goes up and the error goes down, obviously. So what you're always looking for is a high base quality. This base quality is always represented in integers. In principle, you can also calculate it as, as a numeric, so with, with digits uh, behind the comma, uh, but uh, usually they are represented as integers. Um, this is a very typical plot that you first see when you look at a uh, quality report in PostQC. Um, and uh, what this image depicts is the average um, base quality, or actually the distribution of base quality along the read. So you see over here, uh, for all, and that's for all your reads together. So for all your reads together, at the first base, there is a distribution of base quality, let's say between 30 and 34. So we have seen that the base quality of 20 has a 99% accuracy, base quality of 30 is even a higher accuracy. So you are re really looking at very uh, high accuracy over here at the beginning of the read uh, on average. If we go further along the read, if we go up to even all the way, these reads are probably 250 base pairs. So if we over here, let's say at 160 base pairs, there's a very wide distribution. There are some reads with uh, high base qualities, but there are also many reads with very low base quality that are in this red zone. And that probably, that means that base quality is, or accuracy is below 99% and therefore, uh, well, very high error rates to be expected. So this is not a great um, quality of your reads. Bamsi has a question. It, yes, uh, sorry. So this is a plot from Illumina, right? Yes. Sorry, so, it would be Illumina reads, yeah. And uh, like it, it's it's from one particular sequencing run or it's from multiple stuff? Like uh, it's an average of many runs because technically we should we should have something, the range around 150 to or 50 to 300, which should be more better. But here around something like 150, the quality is getting low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so this is um, uh, an uh, example of a single lane, a single sequencing lane. Oh, okay. um, and, the, and over here, the sequencing apparently didn't bend very well because we get very low base qualities towards. Yeah, and the also, it depends upon the cluster density as well. Yes, uh, depends on cluster density, uh, definitely, because if you have a lot of overlapping clusters, then the base calling becomes uh, challenging. Uh, can also, I guess, can also relate a bit uh, to the quality of the DNA, for example. Uh, there can be many, many things that, that can cause this. Usually what you can expect, um, if uh, the sequencing provider, sequencing platform you're working together with, they try to make sure that you get high base qualities in the end. So they do all the quality measures and they have the experience to make sure that the sequencing uh, goes well so that you usually have high base qualities, but sometimes it just can happen that uh, the sequencing didn't run well or there were some other problems and you end up with plots like this. And that's of course very important to, um, oh, at least to try to correct uh, for this um, with, with the data you still have or maybe redoing the sequencing. Got it, thank you. So, 
So if you would just align those reads, so this is a visualization of an alignment. We'll go into that a little bit deeper later on uh, tomorrow. But if you would align those reads, uh, this is paired end. So we uh, align from the five prime to the three prime. The little line over here means uh, that part of the fragment that is not uh, sequenced. And then we have read number two over here. And we see a lot of colors over here. And the color means that there's a mismatch with the reference. So these uh, reads over here, we show here, are aligned over here without any trimming. And you see really a lot of mismatches with the reference towards the three prime end of the gene, uh, of the uh, genome, the, oh, no, of the read, sorry. Many errors towards the three prime end of the read. And that's just because this uh, caught by this very low accuracy. And usually um, that if you want to do, for example, variant analysis, that of course will interfere with your variant analysis. So usually if it's that bad, if it's as bad as we see over here, we definitely want to do some uh, quality trimming. Another thing that can occur that is uh, irrespective of the base quality is that you're sequencing adapters. So the, these adapters are added to, uh, to the fragment in order to, for example, to start uh, the sequencing. And what happens that if, you, if the um, fragment is shorter than the read length, as would happen over here. Uh, do you see my mouse or not? Do you see my mouse? Okay, good. So let's say this would be the ideal case where your fragment is longer than your reads. And then you have this part that you do not sequence and these parts that are actually reads. And we have the adapters over here, so no problems there. If the fragment is shorter than your read, then the read actually sequences a part of the fragment and then reads into the adapter on the other side. And then you're sequencing adapter. In principle, it's not a huge issue as of course, not very nice because you're, for example, sequencing uh, the same uh, fragment twice, both the forward and the reverse. So it's a bit um, redundant data, but in principle, not a huge issue. Um, however, you still you do have adapter sequence in your read, and your adapter sequence probably does not occur in your genome. It's it's an artificial sequence, right? So uh, it will result in issues with alignment. So therefore, what we usually do if we see adapter sequences, and usually you see the percentage of adapters increasing towards the three prime end of a read, which makes sense, right? Because uh, the more the, the further it is towards the three prime end of the read, the more likely it is that you're actually sequencing adapter. Um, we are trying to get rid of that because it will result in alignment issues. And that's relatively straightforward to do. So um, the solution for both of these issues would be trimming. So both is low base quality at the five prime end and adapters at the five prime end. So what you do with trimming is you try to find and remove regions or reads with the low base quality, as we saw it in the first example, adapter sequences, as we saw in the second examples. And nowadays, what you also try to uh, remove are poly G sequences. So with more modern Illumina machines, um, they use a two-channel system, a bit technical. I'm not going to explain the entire thing right now, but systems that use uh, two channels, they often have poly G sequences if there have been issues with the base calling. So basically they're the same as, as an N, but they are represented as a G and they are wrong. So uh, you, you should ignore them and therefore you should also uh, remove poly G sequences. For example, if you have been sequencing with a NovaSec 6000, then that's uh, one of the most high throughput Illumina machines. Software to do that, uh, there is a lot of different software. Uh, most frequently used, I think, are Cut, Adapt, and Thermomatic. Uh, in the exercises, we will be using uh, Cut, Adapt, mainly because the syntax, I think, is a little bit easier to understand than Thermomatic. Um, and what we will do is specify the adapter sequences and the minimum base quality we want to keep in order to improve our, the quality of our FOSQ files. Um, 
there are a lot of things that can go wrong uh, during sequences and that you might find in quality uh, control uh, reports. Uh, we cannot cover all of them during the course because it's, it's very diverse, uh, but there are some very nice articles on, on sequencing problems, quality control problems that can occur on sequencing.qcfill.com. Uh, so if you are running into an issue and you're not really sure why it's there, there it's quite likely that there's a, an article on, on this website about it. And it's very nicely explained with examples. That about quality control for now, at least. We will go into deeper into it during the exercises. Are there any questions so far regarding quality control? If not, then we continue to the databases. So with databases, we're talking about over here, our database to store raw sequencing data. And there are three big databases where you can store raw sequencing data. One of them is the DNA Data Bank of Japan, DDPJ, NCBI, uh, which is uh, the American one or from the USA, and the ENA, which is the European uh, database. I see that there are some questions in the chat. Okay, it's on Slack, that's good. Um, and nice, the nice thing about it is they, they are huge databases to really store insane amounts of raw sequencing data. And they have all have a very similar format. And that format is uh, kind of decided by the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration. So that's the collaboration between these three big uh, databases. And, ba and through all three of those databases, uh, connections, you can get all the data that is in either of those databases. So it's, it's a very powerful uh, system. Gabriela, you had a question. Um, yes, I have a question. I'm sorry, I posted uh, the question in Slack, but I guess it's difficult for you to, to catch up with yeah, the question. Yeah. Now, um, um, regarding quality control um, and the, um, the programs to remove adapters, I know that um, some companies can deliver uh, the FASTQ files uh, without the adapters. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, would you uh, still recommend could adapt? to do the, the quality control to trim the sequence with low uh, base quality? Uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. So um, in general, what you, uh, if you, so if you do not see any adapters in your quality control report, it, well, it doesn't really make sense to do adapter trimming uh, too much. So uh, you can you can just do it again, just to be sure that all, all adapters that you would be able to find are gone. If we're talking about in the trimming for base quality, uh, a lot of the software you will be using downstream, for example, in, in your alignment, will take base quality into account. So for example, if you do variant analysis, um, then uh, if you're calling, calling a certain SNP, for example, with the ATK or Freebase or whatever, uh, they take these, this base quality into account. So if you get a low base quality, so let's say if there's a read aligning and, you see, and they see a base quality of five, they take it into account in a model. So they, stay, they take that uncertainty into account in a model. However, if you have very low base qualities as this problematic uh, example, as I showed in the presentation, then it's always a good idea to have at least some basic trimming there. Because you know base quality below 10, uh, might even mess up the alignment for a bit. So um, then really trimming for base quality makes sense. If you have a, a nice report, so if you have nice um, base quality distribution over your entire uh, read, then it might not even make sense to uh, do uh, trimming for base quality at all. Yeah, and for me, um, it's also, um, I'm not sure when I, I, I should do it or not, because in the report of FASTQC, we have like all these uh, tags which are in um, green check mark or uh, mm -hmm. in cross or in yellow. So for example, if we get all in, in green check mark, so it means that we don't need to do any trimming before. Yeah, so what FASTQC does, 
it just uses a range of a, a quality measure and then says, okay, this is green, this is orange, this is red. Uh, but it depends a little bit on your application, whether that, that also is true for your application. For example, if you do RNA sequencing, then almost always in the overrepresented sequences, you see a, a red cross, but that's actually something you would expect from RNA sequencing. Um, but, you know, for example, for, for adapter sequences, if you see a green thing, probably you do not have to turn for adapter sequences. Also for base quality, if you see a green, uh, well, thing over there, they probably also do not have to trim for base quality. And what about uh, the reads, the size of the reads? Because I know that sometimes uh, you can get like a shorter reads um, than expected. So it, isn't it good to remove those reads as well, or you will wait until the, um, the variant calling analysis uh, that they just don't take into account for the variant calling? Um, yeah, so if you have, so in principle, by, by default, uh, the Illumina sequencer will always, as far as I know, will always provide you with uh, all the reads the same length as you have specified uh, in the settings of the machine. So meaning if you specify it in the setting of the machine, okay, I'm going to sequence 150 base pairs, all of your reads are expected to be 150 base pairs long. They might have very low base quality, they might have adapters in there, but most likely they're all 150 base pairs long, unless you really... It, your, if, if your adapters were, so if your fragment was that short, that you're also starting to sequence out, outside your adapters, then you might expect uh, shorter sequences. But that is quite unlikely if, you, if there was some QC uh, during the library preparation. Okay. Um, so in your case, that might have been caused by the trimming, by adapter trimming. Um, so what you tend to do is usually set a threshold on minimum read length, because for example, very short reads, for example, 10 base pairs or even shorter, they are very difficult to align, to map. Um, however, usually also, again, the mapping software takes it into account. So by default, they already, already get a lower mapping quality and the mapping quality will also be taken into account by uh, downstream analysis software. And one more Long question, and that's sure. it. Uh, what does PCR uh, free library does exactly? Because many companies offer uh, to do that, uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, and they uh, it's like uh, also like I think that they all always sell it that uh, that your sequence we have will be more we have more quality or more pure more pure reads, but I'm not sure about that. What exactly does it mean? Yeah, so PCR does basically two things. Um, you can get uh, a fragment bias, so some fragments get amplified more efficiently than others. So that can cause a non-equal uh, distribution of your genome, for example, depending on GC content. And secondly, what you can have is reads coming from the same amplicon or the same, let's say, uh, initial fragment, going, we call them PCR duplicates, uh, in your sample. And for depending on your application, that can violate the assumptions you have when you do, for example, variant calling. So if you have PCR free, you usually need uh, quite high input uh, because you need to start with a certain amount of uh, library. Okay. Uh, but then you you should not have uh, these uh, negative uh, these disadvantages of, uh, of PCR. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Welcome. Um, Sheena. Yes, sorry, a question. Related to the framing of the adapter, for example, do you need to know the sequence of it? Yes. So is that something that usually like the company that sequence provides you or is something that you look at it mm -hmm. because there is a high abundance of it and you realize it's not part of your... You can always ask the, the, uh, your uh, sequencing platform, but uh, sequencing adapters are very universal. So okay. meaning for Illumina, they are almost always uh, the same. Okay. So, and the nice thing, by the way, I can just show that about FOSQC is that it actually shows what kind of adapters it finds. So the number of adapters are limited. So what you see over here is uh, oh, the yeah. color depicts the type of adapter it found. Yeah. And the Illumina and universal adapter, that's kind of the standard adapter, let's say. And, and we found that one quite frequently in this data set. Okay. 
And then, you know, okay, I need the Illumina universal adapter. The only thing you still need is the adapter sequence. Uh, you can either Google that in the exercises, you will actually use the sequence. You can see that what that sequence is, and you could also use that, uh, well, in your own work. Great, thanks. All right, good. Any other questions regarding quality control? No, then I go on to the databases. So databases, very big, uh, lots of data, uh, lots of raw sequencing data is, is generated. Uh, it, it grows exponentially. And that data can be stored in either of those three databases. Um, their structure is the same for all three, and they can be a bit challenging to understand at first. But it makes sense, I would say. So it all starts with a project and samples. So a project would be, well, the, 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 the project you're working with, for example, related to a grant. Um, and the sample would be uh, a biological sample that you are taking. For example, you're taking a lung sample of a mouse, then that would be a sample. And you can register that in all of those three databases. Uh, usually do, do it, of course, only with one, but they can be registered in the same way in all three databases. If you combine a sample with a project, uh, that would be an experiment where you're actually going to do stuff with that sample. And if that is sequencing, then um, you get a run ID. And a run ID would is typically the output of a single sequencing lane. And those run IDs, they contain the usually FASTQ files that you can directly download from, for example, a sequence read archive, but they can also be stored in a BOM file, but typically that's the FASTQ file. Um, there are command line tools that you can use to actually retrieve that data. Uh, they are quite efficient and quite nice, I would say. Uh, because we're talking about very big data files, uh, that is not a trivial thing, not always a trivial thing to do because you want to be sure you have downloaded the entire data file. So what you usually do is first uh, prefetch your uh, data with prefetch, where it, which uh, downloads your data in, in an SRA specific format. So you cannot really use it yet. And then you convert that to, for example, a FASTQ file. Um, in order to retrieve uh, sequences other than raw sequencing uh, reads, for example, assemblies or, or genes, you can use uh, a very nice common line tool called Entree Direct. You can search and retrieve sequence data with it using eSearch and eFetch, and you will actually use Entree Direct in the exercise. So you will not learn exactly how to use it, but you will. I will show you uh, an example, and if you're interested in using either SRA2 or Entree Direct, there's a lot of information online. 